many of you have heard the old <laughs> statement that every speaker must have a book? Anybody? Okay. And that may or may not be true, but it's, it's helpful for many, many speakers. But it's not just writing the book that counts. Unless, perhaps, if you're Stephen King or Daniel Steele and people are waiting for your next book to come out and lined up to buy it and pre-ordering it. The rest of us need to do things with our book to make them worth the investment of time and energy and help use them to help promote our businesses. So these four wonderful members of our NSA chapter use their books in different ways. So I thought it would be a really in, 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 uh, enlightening thing for us to hear about how many different ways you can use your book to promote your business. So we're going to start today with Vicki Mullins, actually, we'll do ladies first. <laughs> and I'm going to read her introduction, and then she's just going to tell you a little bit about what she does in the book publishing business. And then we'll go through each of our panelists. We have Vicki Mullins, we have Ted Rogers on the left, Tyrone Holmes to her right, and Les Taylor on closest to me, so that you, in case you don't know everyone. So Vicki Mullins' passion for book publishing began in college where she completed a degree in journalism. The design and creation of multi-page documents was the catalyst for her founding her business, Mullins Creative Inc. And it is a boutique graphic design firm that has created book covers and interiors since 1991. Many of our members have books published by Vicki Mullins and Mullins Creative. In 2005, Vicki authored her first book, and it grew to be a series of eight books, eight titles. She soon learned strategies and potential sales opportunities associated with special market campaigns, which you'll hear more about today, and began selling books in her series, I Want You to Know Me, by the thousands. Anybody like to sell books by the thousands? Yeah. Since 2010, when she and Ted Rogers formed Perfect Bound Marketing, the two have been shepherding authors through that process, the independent publishing process. From manuscript to marketing, their goal is to create quality books, enabling authors to maintain control and ownership of their books, and maximize the revenue from their books by selling them by the truckload. So Vicki, tell us a little bit about your experiences. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much. The purpose of the assignment I was given today was to talk somewhat about print on demand because that's a, an area that many authors get themselves involved with, but they don't really know, understand the difference between print on demand versus um, traditional publishers picking them up. But they also get confused when you hear oftentimes independent or self-publishing versus print on demand. So I'm not even going to talk about traditional publishers today because more than likely most of us will never get our books through um, a traditional publisher. If you do, congratulations. And I see a couple people back there I know that go through tradition, have had the privilege of having their books published through a traditional publisher. But today we're going to talk a little bit about print on demand and how it connects with self-publishing versus independent publishing. So print on demand is really just the printing side. It's, it's a technology that has been created um, that allows a book to be printed as a book of one for a very low cost. So that low cost then has allowed people to come in at a very low entry level to be able to print books. So POD is print on demand. And with that low entry level, many people started coming in and just doing the books themselves. And the acronym for print on demand became a, a piece of dung, <laughs> P-O-D. Because they were trying to do everything themselves instead of referring to professionals. So with print on demand, you can get a book of one or a book of a hundred pretty much at, I'm going to say, a finger snap because it doesn't take too long to get it printed. But before it gets printed, the key really and truly is, is to get pub, um, professionals brought in on the book ahead of time. Professionals like Barbara McNichols and Bob Kelly, I'm just looking for him, and I'm, thank you, <laughs> Bob Kelly, 
to have them come in and do the editing of the book because the content is the most important part. Even though you can get a professional designer like things w that we do and other, many other companies do, is to put it together with a professional cover and a professional interior, you do need to have a quality content because if it doesn't, it doesn't sell very many books. So the biggest, the most important part of a print on demand is to be able to get the book created by a professional first. Online, there are lots of online companies that you can hire and the most important thing to do with them is to be sure to watch the contracts that they give you because oftentimes they will, I mean, everybody needs to make money, right? And they may bring you in on a very low design level and say, oh, we'll design your book for you for 200 bucks. And they'll give you a template, which might or might not be very professional. But um, they'll give you a template, not very creative. And then they attempt to sell you the, your books because that's where they're going to make their money since they're not making it in the design world. So therefore, you'll pay a lot of money for the actual books that you're buying and you shouldn't have to if you're going through the print-on-demand level. When it comes to print-on-demand, the question becomes for everybody, well, you, you've heard this, the, the great little slogan that says you can have quality, you, you can have service, or you can have time, right? Um, the speed but you can have to pick two. There's always something. Well, when people, um, authors, attempt to do print on demand, our question is, well, do you have the money or, do, or is your goal to have the time? Because learning how to do print on demand, there's a lot of specifics that need to go in there and you need to learn about, particularly about the organizations so that you don't make a mistake. But if you are too busy and you don't have the time to do that, you want to hire somebody to do that, recognize that they're going to be making some money off of your books because they're going to be managing all of that for you and you don't have to worry about it. They're the ones that will make sure that the manuscripts are set up properly, that the resolutions are high, all of those kinds of things so that when the books are printed, you're not having to worry about the quality, when it comes back, somebody else is responsible for that. You just go out and start selling. And that, that's another point. Great for print, print on demand. What print on demand has allowed us to do is to order 10 books for a speech next week or for back of the room sales. And when I talk about print on demand, talk, talk about print on demand to many authors, I'll say, there are ways, once you get those books into your hands then, you have to decide how you're going to distribute them because you're not going to have a traditional publisher that is going to be distributing them for you. So there are a lot of easy ways, and one of them obviously is to get it on Amazon and we totally recommend everybody get them on there, get their books on there, even though Amazon takes a big hunk of your money because they're the final retailer. And that's all right, because I like to think of them as just gravy. Because there are random people that would put your keywords about your title or your topic in, um, on, on uh, the internet to do a search, and you want to make sure that they can find them. But if your goal is really to try to make money selling your books, it's not going to be through Amazon. So I recommend you put a website up, but if that is not what you want to do, there are options back of the room. There are options that there are new retail bookstores that you can get your um, books up on. Les has his on a, a little bookstore that he sends people to to buy their book, and he makes more on it because they don't charge so much as um, Amazon. So there are lots of ways to distribute your books, but the priority then is always is to make sure that the content is professional, make sure that all there must, there's no mistakes in there anybody can catch you at, and it's designed well, it grabs attention, and the actual printing is quality. All right. Thank you, Vicki. Good. One of the things that I, I've noticed in hearing talks about book publishing is that some of the things that Vicki's talking about that you have to do when you use print on demand, you still have to do even when a big publisher publishes your book, not necessarily the distribution, but figuring out how to get it out there in the public and help them to know, you know what it is that you're doing. So some of that promotion has to happen anyway. 
But we're going to go on to Ted Rogers. And Ted Rogers is president of Inspired Living Systems and past chair of the National Speakers Association President's Council. And he speaks internationally on performance and lifestyle strategies. He is the best-selling author of the Fit and Fast series, which is a lifestyle series of books, which has sold more than 500,000 copies. He provides integrity-based resources um, sorry, and services for authors and publishers who want to learn the strategies of selling their book by the truckload. That word again, selling your book by the truckload, just captures the imagination, doesn't it? Through special market sales. And he's been doing that since 1993. He's been named Volunteer of the Year for the City of Phoenix and has been an advisor for three different Phoenix mayors on youth issues and was a spokesperson for the Special Olympics during his undergraduate college, college studies. So welcome, Ted, about special market book sales. So let me see a show of hands. How many people actually have a book in the marketplace currently today? 63 of you. Wow, that's wonderful. <laughs> and that goes to thank you, Joe Weldon, for that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, our great speaker, Joe Weldon, uh, to get the audience involved right away. I can remember when our first book <laughs> was produced, <laughs> but it was really 63 of you. Uh, I remember the first time when our very first book was presented to us. And you know that feeling of you know, pride and, and hard work accomplished? And then I got my first order. And it was through Baker and Taylor, a distribution, uh, a well-known distribution channel. It was for a single bookstore, Barnes and Noble in Sarasota, Florida. They wanted two books. <laughs> okay, I'll send you two books. We, I had my assistant take the books. I uh, actually, because they were only two, I autographed them. We got them in the mail. We got the fulfillment uh, completed. And as we were looking back at that order. I realized, not counting what I had to pay my assistant for her time and effort to put the books into the mail, I made a dollar and 14 cents. <laughs> and I estimated that I'd be 186 years old before I could retire off of my one book. <laughs> and I realized the, the normal, what was normal back in those days, distribution, retail fulfillment was not satisfactory in my opinion. I was not Stephen King or a well-known political figure who, even though we did have traditional book publishing offers with advances, we've always turned them down because I think and I still believe there's a better way. And what we call special market sales is by far and away, in my opinion, the best retail opportunity for anyone who is an author. It works better, not exclusively, but it works better if you are a nonfiction author. But if you are a fiction author, there's many ways of, of uh, incorporating a client's message, a client's vision, a client's need into your book. And we can talk more about that. Uh, again, if there's a question, we can, of course, answer that. But, but we can talk more uh, uh, personally, too. So what we did, and, and I fell into what we now call special market sales. I fell into it because of a speaking engagement back in, uh, in um, um, Pennsylvania. Uh, outside of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And we had uh, a client that had scheduled us to do some work with him. He really liked our book, and he said, but customers who come through, comes, comes through our line uh, purchasing their groceries. So we negotiated, how do we make that work? We, we looked at how can we make sure that the client is getting the best value for what he was going to be paying for that individual book. And so we started developing these strategies, and that, that very first campaign turned out to be very, very successful. I came home, as most good speakers should do, and evaluated what did we do, what worked, what could work better, and what can we improve on. And from there, we started, and we've sort of created the moniker of selling your books by the truckload since 1992. And what we have come to realize is that when we can take the content of our book, the message of our book, and find a company, an organization, an association in which that same vision, that message, that same message can be shared, there's a, a natural synergy that will give us a, a number of steps towards a client saying, yes, 
I'd like 10,000 books. Yes, I'd like 65,000 books. Or yes, how about 108,000 books? How many of you would love to hear a client say, yes, 100,000 books is just what this campaign, this, this uh, uh, process is, is needing? So that's how we developed it. And the premise, again, just to be a little bit more detailed very quickly, what you want to do is you want to take the, and again, be very, one of the most important things, in fact, I'm going to step away from session market campaigns for a second. If you're going to put your name on a book, you had better be sure that that's a, uh, that book is something of great pride. There are some people in our association that says, you know what, it really doesn't matter how good that book is, just get it into the marketplace. And when Vicki was talking about PODs or POS, that's what you want to avoid. Unless if you don't care what your name is. If you don't care what the, your brand, of course, what your name is the brand. If you really don't care, then go ahead and put a piece of crap out there because if that's good enough for you, then so be it. But if you're going to put your effort a sincere effort into creating a book, make sure it's the best book you can do. And that is, uh, you know, and again, Vicki and I, as, as Debbie said, you know, we, we've actually, and, and Perfect Bound Marketing started here, right here in this room, four years ago. We did a presentation together, and afterwards, everybody kept coming up and saying, would you do this for us? Can you do this for us? Will you do this for us? And Vicki and I looked at each other, and again, we may, may not be the brightest people in the world, but we said, you know what? Something should happen here. <laughs> but the point is, make sure you invest in the book. And, and again, and I'm not trying to sell services, but I'm like Barbara McNichols and Bob Kelly, ghostwriting, editing, cover design. Uh, make sure it's the best it can be because if it's not, you really don't want to have your name on it. And we get books all the time where people are asking for our marketing help. And, and they are, they're terrible books. In fact, we got one from a gentleman who's a president of a university. And it's a horrible book. And the only thing I could say to him is, number one, I won't participate in this because the book's not worthy to be in the marketplace. So make sure it's the best book possible. So back to special market campaigns. Identify the content. Be truthful with yourself. Identify the content. Identify the message. Identify how that message can be utilized in a marketplace to help a company, a corporation, an association, an organization fulfill their intent to reach more people, to fulfill their intent to satisfy their, all, their members already. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's an association and your content uh, uh, describes you know, being the best leader possible. Well, what organizations um, are there that are exclusively about leadership? There's hundreds of them. A approach that association with this, because of the message, because of the vision of your book, and see if there's a match there. Um, so again, and I know there'll be questions and we'll be a little bit more in, in depth, but the whole premise is, I have, I have said since 1993, if I sold another book through the traditional retail channels, I wouldn't care because I'm going after those orders, and we get orders of 3,000 books. We get orders of 4,000 books. And for us, those are actually small orders because our goal is 50, 75, 100,000 books at a time. And it is absolutely possible. It's, and now again, this is not a get rich quick scheme. You've gotta work, you've gotta be willing to pick the phone up, you've gotta be willing to, to hear the word no, and of course, no is always followed by the word yeah. next, okay? But it's a, it, the, the special market campaign is underutilized. It's available to most, if not all, authors. And again, we'll, 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 uh, we'll have more answers and questions uh, uh, in a few minutes. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ted. And I know from attending a few living room forum sessions with Vicki and Ted that there are considerations that you need to think about and how you set up your book so that you can provide the kind of pricing for special market sales. So there's a lot to learn. Our next presenter is Tyrone Holmes, our president-elect. He didn't put that in his bio, by the way. I don't know why. <laughs> Tyrone is a certified per personal trainer through the American Council on Exercise and a level one elite cycling coach through USA Cycling. He's also a champion cycler. So that's how he stays so fit and trim and energetic. He has published three books, Training and Coaching the Competitive Cyclist in 2010, 
developing training plans for cyclists and triathletes in 2011, and the business of training and coaching in 2014. All three books have been published by Human Kinetics and DSW Fitness as part of a self-study course for people like personal trainers and health professionals and athletic coaches so that they can earn continuing education credits. Tyrone authored over 550 posts for his Fitness Corner blog and has published numerous articles for periodicals such as IDEA Fitness Journal, IDEA Trainer, Success, and Speaker Magazine. He authored the chapter titled Pyramid Power, Write Your Way to More Business and Income for NSA's marketing book, Speak More. Tyrone is also a regular contributor to Active.com and a diamond level author at Ezine Magazine or EzineArticles.com. So welcome Tyrone. Good morning, everyone. If you would, please grab the handout that uh, says Holmes Fitness Coaching at the top. It's, uh, it says Right for Hire. And the reason that I developed a handout is because I had the sneaking suspicion that the quote unquote right for hire form of publication might be one that not a lot of us are familiar with. And I could be wrong about that. But what I wanted to do was give you some specific information relative to what it is, its advantages and disadvantages. And since we only have five minutes, I wasn't sure I could cover all of that. So I wanted you to have something that you could take a look at later. Real quickly, Right for Hire is simply a form of freelance publication in which the person who is publishing the writing document, and that could be a book, an e-book, it might be an article, might be a training manual, but whatever the written document is, they are paying you a flat fee to create that document. So it's someone paying you X number of dollars to create a book. Now, I'm not going to go through all the advantages and disadvantages. You have them listed there, at least some of the most significant ones. But you might, as you might imagine, there are certainly pros and cons to this approach. For example, a significant pro to this approach is that there are absolutely no expenses for you as the author. And some of the things that Ted and Vicki were talking about in terms of getting editors and proofreaders and individuals like that, that's all taken care of by the person who is publishing that book. Of course, the potential con would be is that you have a very specific limit on the amount of money you can make, and that is that flat fee that you earn. There are no royalties. There's no chance to sell 108,000 books uh, and, and things of that nature. And so it may not be for everyone, but if you turn over, I want you, or turn the page, I want you to think about three questions. And these are questions that you want to consider to, to basically answer for yourself whether a right for hire is going to be good for you and your business model. Now, what I've done, as you can see, is that I put the questions in blue ink, and then the black ink is how I answered those questions in the creation of my three books and how it has really been a benefit to me. Now, the first question simply is what and how big is the market for your book? Now, for me, uh, as, as uh, Debbie alluded to, I basically write primarily for cycling coaches, triathlon coaches, and to a lesser extent, personal trainers and other athletic coaches. And I'm here to tell you that is not a huge market. In fact, I don't think there are 108,000 of those individuals, period. So we're certainly not selling 100,000 books. So I wouldn't really have to concern myself with missing out on an opportunity to sell 50,000 books because there's just not enough people to buy those. So that's an instance in where a right for hire can actually be a, a, a good approach. If you look at the second question, what are the unique characteristics of that market niche and that's going to motivate them to potentially buy your book? That's why I saw a real advantage because as Debbie alluded to, one of the things everyone in that market niche has in common is that we are required to get CEUs in order to maintain our licensure and our uh, certification. And because of that, many of us actually buy books where you can, actually, you can take an exam, pass the exam, and earn X number of CEUs towards your certification. So I knew that it was not a large market, but it's a captive market. It's a number of individuals that, of course, didn't have to buy my book, but that would certainly be a viable source of them getting useful content as well as earning the CEUs they needed for their recertification or relicensure. And that leads us into the third question is, how ultimately does your book address those characteristics? And I knew that if I really did two things, one was have really valuable content, and I think uh, Vicki and Ted really talked to that in any format. You want to have valuable content. 
You want to have content that people not only are interested in, piques their interest, but it allows them to take something from the experience of reading that book away that they can apply it. I wanted, for example, cycling and triathlon coaches to know how they could coach their athletes more effectively after they read my book. I wanted personal trainers and other athletic coaches to know how they could run a business more effectively after they purchased my book. So that was, n that was one thing. The second thing is that I wanted to make sure that it would f uh, meet certain characteristics so that, so that it could be eligible for CEUs. And working with the ultimate publisher, we were able to make sure that that happened so it would meet both of those characteristics. So really in closing, this is what it, it came down for me, uh, to for me. One of my primary goals in uh, uh, doing the books that I have done and will continue to do is I wanted to do something that would generate a fair amount of income, and you can generate a significant amount of income through Write for Hires. You're not getting paid a few hundred dollars to write a, a book. You're getting paid many thousands of dollars to do that. Uh, you're not getting paid, well, sometimes you're getting paid a few hundred dollars to write an article, but you can get as much as people have gotten $1,500 for, for a 1,500-word article. So there are some significant relatively lucrative opportunities out there with Right for Hires. And that was one thing I wanted to take advantage of. But the other thing is that I had a goal and continue to have a goal of being one of the elite cycling coaches in the United States. And a big part of that was raising my profile and demonstrating the expertise that I had when it came to the various elements that go into being an effective cycling coach. And I found that this was a very, very good way of doing it because it allowed people who might otherwise have never heard of me to see the book to experience it, and I can't tell you the number of times people have said to me, I read your book, and this was really, really helpful. I've been utilizing the, some of the things you talk about and working with my athletes and things of that nature. So uh, take a look at this. If you have questions, of course, you'll have a chance to ask those, but let me just close by saying it can be a very, very effective and very, very empowering way to uh, uh, publish. I got to tell you, I love, I love being here at NSA. You know, I, I mentioned how Vicki and I started a partnership. Well, next week, guess what we're going to do? Tyrone and I are going to write the book, Training and Nutrition for Cyclists. And then we're going to go to Trek Bicycles, and we're going to approach the, the 168,000 bikes they sell every single year, and we're going to include that book free of charge because Trek wants to uh, make sure that cycling becomes a passion for each and every one of those people, right? Cool. So guess what? <laughs> There's plenty of space for big orders, truckload orders with bicycle, bicyclists and, and trainers. Thanks, Debbie. You saw it happen. The magic happens here at NSA, right? How many of you have audiences or some audiences who have to get CEU credits, continuing education credits? So there's potential there for that type of an arrangement as well as other things. All right, our final panelist today is Les Taylor, who's president of Outperformers International. Les is a professional speaker, executive coach, and award-winning author. His business consultancy helps individuals and organizations ra radically improve their performance capacity. Sounds like a book title in there. Prior to entering the private sector, Les enjoyed a 26-year career in law enforcement as assistant chief of police in Tempe and as executive directory, director of the Arizona Association of Chiefs of Police. After retiring from local law enforcement, Les traveled internationally teaching leadership principles to government and military leaders in Europe, Eastern Europe, Africa, South America, the Caribbean, and Canada. Les is a graduate of Arizona State University and the FBI National Academy. He is a past president of our very own chapter here, NSA Arizona, and he's written two books on performance improvement and over 90 articles for easingarticles.com on topics of performance improvement and personal and professional development. So welcome, Les Taylor. Well, I have the great pleasure this morning of talking about mini books. How many of you have written a mini book? Okay, 63. <laughs> so, <laughs> 62, sorry about that. I, just a quick glance there. As I mentioned to you, this really is a privilege for me because I love this product. I love these little mini books. I was first exposed to them. I was speaking at an IMC conference here in the Valley, and um, David and Kathy's side were exhibiting in the exhibit hall their, uh, their mini book display. And I started looking at that, and I was just absolutely gaffed by the concept. Part of the reason for that was 
because it fits my business model so well. Many of you subscribe to my, uh, to my newsletter every week called Getting More With Less. And you know that my whole approach to almost everything I do is, is really cut to the chase. It's get to the point. It's get on with it. So I have the, the one-page business plan. I have a one-page performance plan. I have a one-page position description instead of a job description, and so on and so forth. So this really fit well with my business model. Moved ahead, had my first small mini book uh, developed. And by the way, this is going to be, I'm going to rewrite this book this year because the title of my first mini book was Stop Walking in Circles. Well, I've since written a full-size book on that, and I want to update the mini book so I, can, so I can pass that out. But one of the primary benefits of a, of a mini book, and I highly recommend this to you, is the marketing aspect of the mini book. A couple of reasons, and let me kind of go through this list fairly quickly. First of all, a mini book draws attention. When you put a mini book on a seat or on a table, you will see people immediately pick it up, start to read through it, and usually stick it in their pocket. And in the process of doing that, they kind of take you home with them. It's also a great conversation starter. Almost every conversation I have when I'm traveling, I'll carry a, a supply of mini books with me and I'll pass them out and always hand them out to seat mates in an airplane, along, something along those lines and it always starts an interesting conversation. I also believe that a mini book is really better than a business card. And the reason I think it's better than a business card is because there's more information in the book and on the covers of the book than you can put on a, on a business card. And you would be surprised almost every time you give someone a mini book, they take a look, take a look at it, they leaf through it, and then they ask you to sign it. It's, it's really a, a great way. It's also a great way to market your full-size book. Uh, the mini book that you have in front of you today that, we, that uh, and Kathy have provided for you is uh, You Are the Brand, Own Who You Are. That has turned to an, into a much-requested presentation of mine uh, titled You Are the Brand and uh, You Are the President and CEO of, of YOU Incorporated. Whenever I'm negotiating for a presentation workshop or a seminar, Always, part of my negotiation is, obviously, I want to sell my book in conjunction with the uh, presentation. Offer them a mini book to everybody that's going to attend the, uh, the workshop or the, or the conference. And they jump on that like a chicken on a June bug. They love the idea that you're going to, that you're going to be able to, uh, that they're going to be able to give something out to, their, uh, to those who are attending. And then, and then obviously, you want them to, uh, to buy your your book as well so you can sell those those extra copies. It's a fabulous presentation giveaway. You can give the book away during a presentation. You can add a bookmark to it. Uh, you can use it as an add-on as part of your as part of your presentation to a potential buyer when you're negotiating as I mentioned to you before. Great bargaining chip in, in negotiations. It's also a standalone product. I sell my mini book for $4.95. I will almost always sell a fairly large quantity of mini books at the back of the room after a presentation that I do. The uh, second to the last thing is that size does matter. Uh, these books, these mini books, are so easy to travel with, and secondly, they're, they're just easy to carry around. Uh, for the men in the room, it's easy for you to take that mini book and just put it in, in your shirt pocket. It's very easy to, uh, it's a fast read. Travelers love that. Travelers love the idea that when they're sitting on a plane flying from here to San Diego, they could take your mini book and have that thing finished by the time they, by the time they reach their destination. In terms of production, David and Kathy couldn't make it more easy for you to produce uh, in a, in a, with a template in a, in a specific format, Microsoft Word template, they even have templates for the covers, and there's a number of different covers that you can choose. They provide a project planning worksheet, so if you're scratching your head wondering, how am I going to get this thing written, it's pretty easy to, uh, to do with their, with their worksheet. And this is, a mini book is something that you can convert to a full-size book. As a matter of fact, I would suggest to you, if you haven't written a book yet, start by writing a mini book. 
and then go on from there. And I think you'll find a, a, a really practical way to, uh, to market your, your business. Now, there are a number of members in the organization, 62 by Ted's count, that have written uh, many books. Kathy Dempsey, who is here today, Randy Gork, uh, Tyrone helped uh, uh, Patty Porter put her book together. Kay Server is here. Beth Terry, who's not here, I think she's traveling. And then uh, Gary Yamamoto and Andrea Gold. By the way, I uh, read Gary and Andrea's book yesterday. And this thing is just chock full of useful, very useful information uh, for authors who speak. So I would highly recommend this to you. As I mentioned to you before, there, there are a number of different ways you can market yourself through your mini book. David was showing me this, this little sticker that I could have produced that I could put on my shirt coat or have maybe have some, some folks in the audience uh, that have hired me to speak, have them wear on a lapel or on their dress to kind of market my book. Here's a little carrying case, whoops, uh, a carrying case that you can use to uh, take your books around with. I always have one of these in, in my cars, and I'm always looking for opportunities to pass my mini book out. And if you're traveling with mini books and you're going to carry, you want to take a couple of hundred, you can carry them in boxes like these. You can put a couple of these in your carry-on luggage and you're good to go. This is just a fabulous little product, and I highly recommend it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Les. <clears throat> we had Haley Foster here last month, and she brought 40 of her mini books to sell and was kicking herself because she didn't bring more because she ran out. So who has a question for our esteemed panel? Yes. Thank you. I think we all recognize that the world of publishing has changed a lot the last several years. What do you see as some of the upcoming trends in the world of publishing? Well, I think that the main one is faster. I think the marketplace really is, is seeking uh, information that can be, again, good information that can, can be compiled and distributed in a fast quick uh, manner. You know, again, we're, we're, everything we're doing is, is such a fast pace, and I think publishing is going to follow that. As Vicki talked about uh, print on demand, uh, you know, the smaller formatted books, I think those things are really going to be the, the, the trend in the next three to five years. Yeah, the other thing is electronic publishing is only going to get bigger and bigger, so more and more books are going to be published electronically, so that's probably another m major trend. What do you think about having only an e-book and not doing the printing? I think it's a great place to start. Again, it's a low-cost entry level because once you just type up your book, book basically and get a, a, co a, covered, a front cover designed, you can have a book. And so what it allows you to do is start to build your platform, getting people to be aware of it, and you see how it goes. You get ref um, feedback on your book. It was too long, it was boring, this area needed more. And before you really invest in a full printed book, you have that opportunity with an so ebook. My encouragement is, is to identify who your ideal reader is. And if it is somebody over 35 years of age, I absolutely uh, would encourage you to consider both ebook and, uh, well, let's just turn 35, so we're okay with that. Um, um, but we want to have both. But the other thing is when, when you do talk about ebooks and speaking, again, and I agree completely with Tyrone, you want to have both, or you, you want to have that hardcover book there. But you can also have, for the people that are dedicated Kindle readers or the electronic readers, you could have a little credit card or a little business card made up, and for that specific organization that you're speaking at, that card could be $3, $9, whatever you choose it to be, but it could be a specific code that could be linked back through your website. Uh, again, uh, again, bringing value to that client that's paid you to speak, but now you're giving the opportunity for their individual employees, uh, members, to get that book electronically. Your name, your brand is still in front of it. And <laughs> uh, well, you had mentioned it's, when you speak, it's good to have books at the back of the room. Well, you can get the QR code delivered on a, pro a brochure, a flyer, a card alone. And while your um, audience is sitting out there, they can go right there, click that QR code, and buy that download. And they can have your ebook in their computer 
on their phone right now in this presentation. So it work, It can actually, an ebook can go both ways. And you, so you can make your sale right there even before you go to the back of the room. I, two quick questions. Um, the first one is for Les. Do you also, when you negotiate your speaking contracts with your clients, do you give them two price structures, one just for the talk and then one for the talk and the book? Or do you just automatically include the book as, as part of your fee? I usually automatically include the mini book in, in the cost of the presentation, but I bill that cost into the, into the presentation that I'm negotiating for. So they always have your book. Right. I like it. And then my next question is for Ted. Um, do you also market books that people are working with traditional publishers? Uh, yes. And, and, and again, if, you're, if you've got a contract with a traditional publisher, you would have to go back in and renegotiate that contract because most of those contracts are exclusives with that publisher for that specific title. However, many books, if not most books, are actually, there's, there's a second book there. So if, you ha if you've got a traditional publishing contract and you cannot renegotiate that, you can create that second book. And again, speed is important, but, but you, can, you can create that second book that is uh, specifically created and developed for the special market campaigns. Um, many of you are familiar with Deborah Gardner. We do a, a small book for Deborah Gardner. And we just finished one this week that she is speaking for MPI up in Oregon next month. And what we did for her on her small book is that we put a letter, we customized it as, it was, as if it was a special market sale. So there's a letter there from the executive director of MPI in Oregon, and their education department is giving a book to every single member at that meeting. So whether it's a smaller book or a larger book, you can get those customized. With a smaller book, it's very, very easy, and it's, um, it's a cost effective for an organization even to buy 30. Print on demand. That allows us to produce something like the, uh, these small books at a, small, at a sh smaller rate and still make it very affordable for an organization. So we're combining both print on demand and special market sales and the small book. Yeah, one quick comment. Randy Gork's new book on leadership, 101 Ways uh, to Be a Leader, I think it's titled, is um, he will present this to a client without a cover. And then he will sell them on the idea that they can customize the cover. They can put their company logo on the cover. They can give these out as a, as a gift from the company and does very well at that. Okay, we have time for one more question, then we're going to wrap it up. But I have a whole sheep of questions here, so I'm going to ask our panelists to provide me with some of the answers and print it in an article in the newsletter. So if you have one or two more questions you'd like me to include in that, email them to me quickly at dxner at xnerassociates.com. You get, you get our final question. My question is on market segmentation. Uh, for the customer, let's say you have the opposite problem as Tyrone. If you were writing a, a book for uh, baby boomers who are interested in aging well or being fit, how do you go from you know hun hundreds of millions, uh, you know, get it more focused so that you can target your message? And also, how do you identify blogs that would be good to post on based on who you're targeting? What what tools would you recommend for market segmentation? Well, the thing, the, the first thing we encourage people to do is to to be very and, and this is the key component to a special market campaign and selling by the truckload, is to clearly identify who your ideal reader is. So again, if it's, if, if it's baby boomers, you want to identify maybe there's a segment. Maybe it is 55 to 70. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's an older. If it's a fitness book, 55 to 70 is probably going to be a, a, a stronger target. Is it male? Is it female? Uh, it, it, are they individuals who are geographically located? Um, because once you start identifying those principles, those properties, what you then go back and do is ask yourself, here's that specific, clearly identified demographic. What products or services does that person use on a daily basis, or a weekly basis, or a monthly basis, or annually, or maybe once in a lifetime? Baby boomers, maybe it's a cruise ship, and maybe it's a, maybe it's a fitness cruise or a cruise that really specializes in fitness. Well, what you can do is you could have that book created specifically for fitness, for baby boomers, um, and you could have it customized specifically for that cruise ship. And how many people go on a cruise that meet that demographic? Probably at least 100,000 a year, if not maybe, maybe a million. 
And those are where the, and that's where those numbers in regards to production cost and cost to a potential client become astronomical. You know, I mean, here's a quick example of one of the, it's a poetry book, it's a, it's a religious poetry book, and the author is involved with a Christmas pageant in which there's about 130 to 150,000 people every year show up to this pageant. And so what we encouraged him to do, we helped him to put together the format, but how do you get, how do you find the right company or product or service that wants to really, to, wants to reach out to a religious organization or religious client reader base and make this book so when you show up to this uh, pageant, every single person gets this book to take home. It's customized with the pageant information. It might be customized even further with religious uh, spiritual ideas. But again, the point is, and what I really want everyone to be encouraged about, is that don't allow yourself to be thrown into a niche or, or, or to, to have that box put around you. Expand your thought process, identify the ideal reader, and everything else is wide open. So thank you all, our wonderful panelists. We have one more thing to do before break, so don't go away.